more and more, the fight against terrorism isn't in vehicles like this, but normal police cruisers. This is a remaining relic of the past. Children, men, and women living with these electrical lines tapping illegally into the city grid. Imagine it if, if, you, if you took a vacation in that Mexican paradise down there, and, and this, this is, is, is what your vacation was like. Check this out. This is not your antivirus software. This is actually a program from the internet that's installing viruses on your computer. Zero gravity. Woo! Zero gravity. I don't know which way is up and neither do the skin. What they're looking for is possibly, possibly a 107 millimeter rocket. Let me show you a picture of one of these 107 millimeter rockets. Phone calls, full duplex communication, two people talking back and forth is big and bulky for a cell phone network to deal with. No matter how big the network is, you can only handle so much. After a while, it's just gonna pop out and it's not gonna work anymore. That's why if the network gets clogged like it did yesterday, you might wanna think about sending a text message. It goes through a separate network than the voice message. And as you can see, text messages are small and sleek. It would take many, many more text messages to fill up this network than it takes phone calls to fill up the same size network. In Valencia, on the Las Vegas Strip. We're live in Key West. Live in New Orleans. From Basra, I'm Dave Malkoff on a Simon in Iraq. In Iraq, it's someplace pretty horrible like this. This is a Mamun to their city. It's a shanty town in West Central Baghdad. This house over here is made out of old swamp coolers, basically old air conditioning parts. 120 families live here, but not by choice. They built these homes from whatever rubble they could find. An old orange drink box makes a new window. We brought all of our kids and uh, the women of our household here. We were threatened with guns and they threw us out of our home. In Baghdad, families live in a Shia neighborhood or in a Sunni neighborhood. There's not much mixing allowed. We were Shiites living in that area. In 2006, and still today, armed thugs have been systematically kicking people out of their own homes. I have six children. For Bushra Nehma and her neighbors, it's forced homelessness just because they hang a picture of the Shia Imam Hussein on their walls. We were forced uh, at the barrel of a gun to get out. Of course, it's not the ideal situation, but what, what are we supposed to do? We have, we have nothing else. It's estimated 250,000 Iraqis live just like this, just here in Baghdad, triple that throughout the entire country. That's children, men, and women living with these electrical lines tapping illegally into the city grid and water lines tapping illegally. The sewage just runs out in the street. The garbage is fed to the livestock here. As far as slums go around the world, this is about as bad as it gets. For children and for anybody to have open sewage like this is, is just a huge health risk. Uh, he has uh, indigestion, stomach problems. It's a struggle to keep kids healthy and fed and the leaky mud roof from collapsing. And so you can see down here, they've received a UNHCR tarp on the ground. Last year, the U.S. Embassy spent $200 million to help these people who can't go home. Some people tried to go back and they were killed. I have the right to stay here. This is uh, my, my right. Well, technically, the land is owned by the Iraqi government. Any day now, the police could arrive with orders to kick everyone out and flatten Imam Muntadar city. We have no choice. There is no other choice. We don't have anywhere else to go. It's because they're making an upgrade 12,000 miles up in the sky, and they're building them right about here. Time you landed at LAX, your pilot was using GPS. What you may have missed, what I would call a rather nondescript facility, is the factory you flew right over. Three, two, one. We have liftoff. Three weeks ago tonight, the next generation of GPS satellites launched into orbit. So this is it. This is the new GPS satellite right here. That's right. This is GPS 2F. Built across the street from LAX. As a civilian, uh, it's, it's extremely rare to get this close to any military satellite. Okay, uh, Colonel Dave Madden. And Boeing VP Craig Cooning, Cooning designed this GPS satellite assembly line. It's one of 12 satellites that the Boeing Corporation is building for our partners in the United States Air Force. Let's say what? 12, 12 satellites. 12. The Air Force actually ordered a dozen. And how expensive is, it, is this again? 
Yeah, these satellites run about $121 million a piece. Each. Each. Yeah, yeah, nice. So nearly nice. one and a half billion dollar investment isn't just for your car's nav system. We've got civil aviation. Banking transactions rely upon the timing. Uh, all the way to the scientific community who uses it to measure the tectonic plates movement. It really has become a world utility. Long before shooting them into space, Boeing shakes the mess out of these satellites. We're going to simulate the environment of space. It's not like uh, an airplane or an iPod or something that you can build, and if it doesn't work right, you just take it back and you fix it. Uh, we get a one-shot deal in space. Up there, one side of the satellite can roast at 400 degrees above zero, while directly on the other side, it's 400 below. Yet the sensitive electronics inside need to stay basically at room temperature. We have 31 up there right now. They last about 12 years, yeah, constantly beaming a signal down to you from over 12 thousand miles up. Inside, each one contains an atomic clock and a real-time map of the sky. When you get multiple satellites, it's able to calculate out where you're located on the ground. In very basic terms, the only way this little guy knows where you are is if that big guy knows what time it is. It's constantly streaming a signal from the atomic clock down here. The further away I am or the closer I am to that clock, that's my position. GPS really does save lives and it's improving the quality of life of everybody on the planet. And one more thing, the Colonel says you now get the same accuracy and access he does. So Colonel, what do you do to make sure the Taliban isn't jamming your system? Yeah, it's kind of ironic uh, that, that if you actually are using GPS jammers, we can actually monitor that and determine that you are using a GPS uh, jammer and we can actually drop a GPS bomb on top of you. The one thing I know is my wife will be able to find her way to the shopping center a lot better with systems like this out there. So now you know it goes way beyond in-car navigation. They have GPS units inside running shoes now. One red cent isn't worth much anymore, even if you're like Dave Reed with a huge penny jar. When this cash register was built, This is over 100 years old, David. A penny had value. And that value was written like this, a C with a line through it. These are machines from the 60s, chrome, a brass one from the 40s. But to find that symbol today, even just to type it out. It's got the C on it. It's about 30 years old. You need to find an obsolete typewriter where the cent symbol sat for generations just above the six. Today, I press option and hit four. Inflation has stripped the cent symbol from its rightful place on the keyboard. Only computer savvy graphic designers can find the Pennywise symbol. Now, I do know where to press the key commands to go find it, but nobody has ever, in the 10 years that I've worked here at Final Print, nobody has ever asked me to use the scent sign in anything. Today, this symbol we all grew up with only appears where chips, popcorn, and Ajax are priced with pennies. For the most part, the age of the scent symbol has passed. Actually, as far as usage goes, it is extinct. For a penny, you can't buy anything anymore. Will future generations not even see that sign? They won't even, they won't even know what a cent was. What used to cost five cents now costs a dollar, and so you don't use the cent sign anymore. It just isn't there. It's still there, but you have to know some computer programming called the alt code to find it. This is the cent symbol right there. It says the alt code is 0162. What does that mean? Look how buried this is. You have to press alt, hold that down while you type 0162. That's the only way to find the old cent symbol. The only other way to find it is to go find Irwin here at American Cash Registers or another place like that, find an old relic like this. In Silver Lake, I'm Dave Malkoff, CBS 2 News. Sometimes it's the low-tech inventions that really wow the crowd. Inside Larson's Steakhouse on Ventura Boulevard, they have a player piano that's hooked directly into a wireless internet songbook. It plays 300 songs. Still, no one really cares. I'll have uh, the grilled salmon. Well, it's got everyone talking. When I first opened it, I said, oh my gosh. Is the menu, not what the is... steak or the sides it lists. Okay, spinach is good. All but right. the menu itself, it gets dark in here. Uh, you see people using their cell phones all the time, lighters to read menus. And here's the solution. Backlit Menus, a company in St. Augustine, Florida, introduced these at a Chicago restaurant convention. They ended up releasing them basically about a week before we opened up, so we were the first ones in the country to get these new, innovative, lighted menus. The far-sighted will still need their glasses. So I can see what I'm talking about. You see people closing them and opening them all the time. They don't just solve a centuries-old steakhouse problem. These things are all LED, so they're energy efficient too, lasting six to eight hours on one charge. If 
finally, those days of squinting. If it was small, tight typeface. And lighting the menu for yourself may have just sizzled out. Uh, no flashlights needed here. There's still one thing I don't get about these light up menus. Why didn't I think of this? In Encino, I'm Dave Malkoff, CBS 2 News. This is not a garbage dump. In fact, it's not a dump at all. It's Dave Kamiti's basement in Hollywood. He's kind of a mad scientist who may be on to something here. So what you're looking at is 10 months worth of my refuse, if you will, recycling and garbage. 99 bottles of beer and soy sauce dot Dave's staircase. Coming over here, we've got the bag of bags. Bag of boxes. These three bins are sort of the everything else recycling. For so one year, Dave is saving all of his trash, including all the paper. This is sort of the biggest uh, piece here. It's like uh, 50 some pounds or so. Paper. Saving it here in the basement. Like this experiment started with a conversation oh. about conservation. When you throw something away, where exactly is away? What if away was the backyard? I'd probably start changing pretty quickly. And what if it was the basement? I'd, you know, it's changed even quicker. So before Dave started drying out every single plastic bag, he was like most of us. That was 10 months ago. I'm now down to about half a pound a month compared to the average American that's 4.6 pounds a day. Here's one way he did it. Uh, I'm at the point actually where I've eradicated my junk mail. Yeah, that alone cuts his garbage pile by a huge percentage. Uh, if you go to my website and just, uh, I think on the left hand side, there's eight things you can do right now. Uh, one of them is get rid of your junk mail and there's, you can do it uh, yourself, which will just take a lot of time. Or there's companies that you can give like 20 bucks a year to. If you've got grease, Dave wants it. This is his ride. And I converted it to run on waste vegetable oil. The french fry grease cost him nothing. Restaurants throw that stuff out. Regular diesel goes in the secondary tank. That tank, it's $50 to fill up, and I fill up maybe every four months, maybe. So somewhere between $150, $200 to drive like a normal person for the entire year. Sustainable Dave now speaks to school kids about this and hands out tips on the radio. But not everything he does saves him money here. In fact, in the kitchen, wasting nothing means spending more on bottled milk. And I'll be, I'll be honest, and I try to be honest with people about this, this costs more. The thing is, he almost never uses the disposal. If the kids have leftovers, the adults might eat it. If the adults don't eat it, maybe Biscuit here will eat it. If she says no, then the leftovers move over to the pet rats here. And if the pet rats don't want to eat it, then it moves on to the worms. Yes, the worms. These are basically night crawlers. They live inside his worm composter. It doesn't smell. The worms will, uh, they'll double in size every month. The worms turn his scrap like food the, into yeah, free yeah, fertilizer. These are things you can do in Hollywood, California. Can you do the same things in Kansas? I think you can do the same things in Kansas. The only thing in Kansas uh, is they probably don't have as much recycling as we do here. So that you have to think even a little more about what you're buying, definitely. I mean, we're, I'm blessed to be here because you can recycle anything here. It's pretty amazing. Who knew living with your own trash was such a blessing? In Hollywood, I'm Dave Malkoff, CBS 2 News. Fertilized by soothing music, pollinated in a pencil pile. I wish for a new beginning. I wish my dog came back. I wish Chris Brown was my boyfriend. The wishing trees are in full bloom. I wish to hit a jackpot in Vegas very soon. I wish for a baby girl. Here in Old Town Pasadena. I wish I had a puppy. Oh, that's adorable. It just sort of happened really quickly. Pasadena's Army Center for the Arts didn't come up with this wishing tree idea. It's kind of funny, too. I wish our neighbors downstairs would move. I know my son came on the first day and he wished for a, a water balloon and a pancake. This is all from the mind of Yoko Ono. Are you Serious? When this project is done, Yoko Ono is going to do something very Yoko Ono with these wishes. Gather them up, put them in a big box, send it to Iceland, and bury it underneath what amounts to a giant flashlight. I wish I could show you what that looks like, but all I have is this crude graphic. It's called Imagine Peace Tower, and it's a tribute to John Lennon. I wish for peace, love, and happiness. I wish John was still available. That's what that oh, one said. I know, I know, I know. These trees just started bearing their hopeful fruit earlier this month. I wish I could be less brutally honest. Already, there's over 10,000 dreams blowing in the summer breeze. 10,000 of these. We've ordered 50,000 more. I wish someone would cut down a tree, make some paper out of it, and hang it on another I tree. I wish to be forever young. Some of the wishes are just really serious. I wish Alex's cancer would I wish my mom would be happy forever. This is the best one down here. It says, 
I wish at least 50% of all these people's wishes actually come true. Wishing you plenty of pencils from the courtyard at One Colorado. Some of them say make a wish. Dave Malkoff, CBS 2 News.